Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Leanna Levine Reisner. I am the Network Director of Plant Powered Metro New York. We're so pleased to have you all with us tonight. Um, and Plant Powered Metro New York is empowering people from all over the metro area to, to take charge of our health with whole food plant based nutrition, which, as you'll hear about tonight, is an evidence based approach to nutrition that really has the potential to not only prevent and treat, but also uh, help reverse chronic illness. Um, and so we are uh, continuing to offer programming online uh, in light of the ongoing pandemic and, and, your, and our collective safety and hoping to bring you a message of hope um, when things are seemingly tough in the world of public health. Uh, there are real true solutions that we think are very empowering. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about uh, something really important, which is um, bringing plant-based nutrition together with uh, Rosh Hashanah and new beginnings. So I'm very pleased to have with us tonight uh, Dr. Melinda Mann. And alongside Dr. Mann, I also want to welcome Karen Stern, who is another Plant Powered Metro New York organizer from Westchester, as well as uh, Jody Graber, who is here with us from Jewish Veg. Uh, and I want to welcome those of you who are joining us from the Jewish Veg community as well to uh, tune in and learn a little bit with Dr. Mann this evening. Um, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box. If you could let us know uh, where you're tuning in from, uh, whether it's in the metro area or in other parts of the country, we're happy to meet anybody wherever you are. Uh, and tell us a little bit about what you're hoping to delve into with us this evening, why you're here, what questions you might bring to the table. And as a reminder, just please continue to mute your lines throughout. We'll be taking questions through the chat box this evening due to the size of the group. And uh, I promise we will get to your questions as they come, even if we don't address them in real time. Um, so a little bit about Dr. Mann. Uh, Dr. Mann is an obstetrician and gynecologist who is affiliated with Maimonides Medical Center based in Borough Park in Brooklyn. Um, she has an incredible story to share with you of her own health and healing and has been inspired to take steps to bring a new lifestyle to her patients, especially patients who are kosher consumers and patients who come from uh, an observant Jewish background who have different sensibilities around food than other communities might um, for specific reasons. And we'll talk about some of the ins and outs of um, how different Jewish communities are thinking about food and nutrition together in this program. Um, and she's definitely helping newly pregnant women to understand how their food choices will affect the next generation, which is such a critical piece of all of this as well. Uh, so with that, Dr. Mann, I'm gonna hand it over to you and you can share a little bit more about yourself as, as we continue. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. See my slides? My slides? Yes, they look great. So uh, I want to thank all the people who helped to bring me to this point. Of course, Liana and uh, all my staff, my IT people and my creative people. And uh, here I am dealing with this technology. And here it says my, inter my internet connection is unstable. Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> you saw that. <laughs> okay, the topic for tonight is considerations in plant-based eating for the Jewish New Year and more on the human microbiome. Actually, this space where I put the greeting, the elbow greeting, I had left it blank initially because really I wanted to put a ram's horn and then I said, no, it's not really vegan. Then I wanted to have an apple dipped in honey and I said, no, honey, people don't eat honey either. It's not vegan. And I decided I'm just gonna leave. Oh, and then I thought to myself, well, we wish each other Lashana Tova. Let's show shaking hands on the slide. And then I said, no, we can't do that either. It's COVID. <laughs> so this was the best I could do. So we have to remember it's the Jewish New Year coming. This is part of the privilege of giving a speech as I get to show my grandchildren. But um, this family lives in Jerusalem and they were in quarantine and COVID. And Liana, do you want to show it from your point of view because the volume might be better? Uh, why it don't just, you try, try it from yours first? Try? I'm not okay. sure I can get it up. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's see if it's going to let me. Can you 
So we're all adapting to COVID in our own way. Um, this whole entire family that I just showed you, they were all sick, and Baruch Hashem, they're all better now. Planned Parenthood Metro New York is the organization that Liana spoke about, and I, I feel very privileged to be a part of it. And it really is the mechanism where we can start at a grassroots level and we can expand and we can bring it to the broader public, the message of whole food plant-based eating. And I am committed to the success of this organization. Okay, so let's start. Here's Dr. Barbie. She decided to give up her glamorous life. She stopped dyeing her hair blonde. She cut her hair and she got accepted to medical school. But she has a test today. Here's her test. Select the most important factor that will improve blood sugar control. Protein, fat, water, exercise, fiber. And she's also trying to dress more conservatively. So, you know, you see her skirt. She's like really trying, but she didn't, she's got the wrong seamstress. But anyway, um, and if I was high and mighty like Dr. Neil Barnard, I would have be polling you all and you'd be giving me your answers about what you think is the true answer. But I'm not up to that yet, so hopefully by the next time I give a talk, I will be. But keep this question in mind, and I hope by the end of this talk, you'll all be able to answer the question. This is current events. August 13th, 2020. Do we spend too much on healthcare? Do we need another article on how much we're spending on healthcare? Well, I guess we do need another article. But um, really, the way I look at it is we're spending too much money on rescue care and sick care. We're the fattest and the sickest, and we've heard it over and over again. It's not because we want to treat ourselves and give ourselves better health care. We're just spending money trying to rescue ourselves from high blood pressure and diabetes and high cholesterol, and all the consequences of that. I have so many women in my practice now in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Many of them are on pills for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and prediabetes, metformin. I hear it over and over again, metformin, Lipitor, metformin, Lipitor, uh, and, and a diuretic. And it's not only limited to this middle age group. I have 19-year-old women now who are gestational diabetics you would never have heard of that in previous years. And we're just all fat cats. That's what we are. Right? This is how I feel when I sit in an LL seat, you know? That, that's just the way we are. So this is a very interesting article. It's from a year ago. And... I want to point out really the mentality of the medical community of how they deal with things. People spend their lives researching this. Predictive model for failed induction of labor among obese women. What does that mean? That means they came up with 10 parameters, and if they say that you're a certain age and height and weight, what's your BMI, and how much, how much weight did you gain? Are you a gestational diabetic or hypertensive? Did you have a prior cesarean? They want to come up with a calculated number of how you're going to fail a trial of labor, and why don't we just do a cesarean anyway and get it over with? And I think that's terrible. But unfortunately, because obesity is so prevalent, this is the focus of our, of our specialty instead of focusing on what can we do to prevent the obesity in the first place. There's just something not right. And then after you have your cesarean because you're obese, I would like to share with you that Maimonides now has opened two five-star postpartum rooms. And they're like hotel rooms. The only thing is you can't put the do not disturb sign on the door. They come disturb you constantly. 
But look, look at the hospitality package that you get right after you have your baby. I think Dr. Mann's um, connection is a little unstable, so we'll bring her back in just a moment. So we're Can back. I control how they move forward? I'm, I'll control it for you, so just give me a little ping if, if I don't. Oh, a ping. A, a little thumb. A, a thummy? Little, that's great. Okay. So, I was, oh, I was talking about the microbiome. We all need to know about it. But... Um, a lot of a lot of Jewish people who are what I call Haredi, meaning they're kind of like stringent in their observance of Judaism. They're not going on the media. They're not going on YouTube. They don't watch TV, and they are somewhat sheltered from all of this exploding knowledge. and And as I explained in my last lecture, I'm sort of fishing around trying to think up solutions to help spread this important scientific information, which, um, which is sort of like revolutionary, if you haven't heard it before. And here's my Femi. Uh, and of course, um, my boat is, is powered by Google. Next. Okay, we, we also spoke about this. It bears repeating. The digestive tract. We eat, we chew, we swallow. The food goes into our stomach, passes into the small intestine, these little, um, these little loops of bowel here, so-called loops of bowel, that's where absorption takes place. That's where we absorb our nutrients. And the large colon is, starts over here. There's the appendix. We have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, shaped like an S, and this is where the stool exits the body. Now, we used to think that this was just a place to store waste, but now we know thumbs up, that there's a tremendous number, actually it's estimated in the trillions, of various types of bacteria in our large colon that actually eat the same food that we're eating, and they produce numerous metabolites which influence our health in a very substantial way. And here's a little slide to sort of summarize what does it mean. The microbiome, bacteria live in us and on us, on our skin, in our mouth, um, and in our gastrointestinal tract, in our uterus when we're pregnant, and through the birth canal when we're giving birth. So these bacteria, they digest our leftovers. We have the so-called useful bacteria, which we nickname the gut buddies. They love to digest fiber, and I don't mean fiber that you pour on your cereal. I mean fiber-rich foods like beans. And they produce short-chain fatty acids, which are butyrate, propionate, and acetate, which are health-promoting. On the other hand, the, there are some harmful bacteria, species of harmful bacteria. They love to digest our animal leftovers. And they create pro-inflammatory substances, including TMAO, which you've never heard of, but it's extremely important. They actually damage blood vessels, and I want to introduce you to the idea of dysbiosis, which means a gut with too many bad bacteria. So these are concepts that are important. Short-chain fatty acids produced from the metabolism of plants have so many health benefits. This is a partial list from Dr. Lee's book. And again, getting back to this butyrate, acetate, propionate, have all sorts of beneficial effects on the body. And they are made by bacteria in our large intestine. And they are made from fibers of plants that we eat. There's no animal product that can give you these three, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. Now, this is kind of a busy slide. It's from Dr. Tang. I, I saw this slide at the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. Don't be scared of it. It's really kind of simple. What I want to explain to you is this. When you eat, not only do you eat, that's called the host. You're the host, and the bacteria live in you. You are the host for the bacteria. So when you eat food, the host eats and the bacteria eat. And each makes metabolites or substances that are produced as a result of the digestion. And the purpose of this slide is to show how interrelated. You can't have one without the other. 
we make something, the bacteria acts on it. The bacteria makes something, we act on it. And round and round, and it affects our physiology and our health. And that's a completely new concept. Now, on the right side of this slide, it also shows what can influence our gut health, namely our genes, our age, where do we live, when do we sleep, how are, us, how are our hormones, male or female, what is our diet like. It's very complex, and we're learning more and more as time goes by, but we need to be very respectful of it to the point where we say in Hebrew, Ma Rabu Masecha Hashem, meaning, it's just beyond our, our ability to grasp at this point, but there's a lot of research being done. Next slide. And this is Dr. Tang there. He's from Cleveland. He's a genius. I only want to call your attention to your high school biology background. Here we are. These are cells. We all learned about cells. The cell has a nucleus, and all cells have different functions. If you look at the top, you see you have fiber, digested by bacteria, leading to the acetate, propionate, and butyrate, the so-called short-chain fatty acids. But look down here at what it can do. It improves the barrier function of the colon. It stops leaky gut. It modulates blood pressure. It can lower blood pressure. It can inhibit inflammation. It can even change the expression of your genes. That's called epigenome. And it can also impact on your immune system in a positive way. So many things that are coming about through eating foods with fiber. It's so simple. Next slide. Now, this is my last complicated slide. Please bear with me. Basically, what do you have here? You have a chubby boy. Everyone sees a chubby boy. He's eating all the stuff he's not supposed to. Animal products, processed food, cakes, Danishes, oh, who doesn't eat Danishes when they're an adolescent? And now we've been able to elucidate the mechanism whereby these foods eventually lead to harmful substances, which eventually lead to all of these unfortunate health outcomes, atherosclerosis, blood clots, heart failure, kidney disease, and type 2 diabetes, which is an epidemic in the United States. Now, this other part of the slide, which is really, it's really current events. Look at the date of it, 2020. This Dr. Tang brought out another mechanism whereby eating the wrong foods can lead to platelets, which are responsible for clotting our blood, that the platelets become overactive, and that leads to more aggregation or clumping of platelets in our system which is predisposing to heart attack, stroke, and I can't read what's under there because it's blocking. What's the third thing under there? Uh, heart attack, stroke, and death. Oh, thank you. I'm glad it's covered up. Okay. Mm. Next slide. I added this slide in because not only do we have to know what yes to eat, but we have to know what not to eat. And there's so many people complaining of mood disorders now. Um, and and again, epidemic of behavioral health issues. We have to remember the processed food, the stuff that we buy in the bakery, the stuff sitting on the shelf in the plastic bag made from white flour and refined sugar is terrible for our health. And we should try to avoid it almost at all cost. It should be really a once in a while treat, not an everyday event. (laughs) Oh, I want to thank my son, Shalom. He got me back up on the internet through his hotspot. Hi, Shalom. Okay. So what are we going to do? What, what's recommended? A lifestyle intervention, nutrition. By the way, um, the answer for Dr. Barbie is on this slide. Fiber intake, resistant starches, improves glycemic control via the production of short-chain fatty acids. Resistant starches means foods like beans, whole grains, nuts, seeds, vegetables, fruits, etc. all of that. And we get our short-chain fatty acids. Now, I put improved satiety in big, bold letters because I have been on so many diets in my life, and I'm sure a lot of the people tuning in tonight have tried everything. In fact, I know people who have done not only one weight loss surgery, but two weight loss surgeries in an attempt to lose weight only to find frustration But you should know that when you make butyrate, 
you start to feel full and you stop feeling like a fox roaming around the forest looking for something. You start to feel good and you stop thinking about food all the time. And I am an example of that. I, and I want to share that with everybody. I invite you to try a whole food plant-based diet. So the reason that we're all like this, we're fat and we're hungry and feeling deprived is because we have a messed up microbiome. I spent the last year and a half trying to fix my microbiome. I hope I'm in the right direction. I can't go in there today and take a sample, although there's a whole science of that, but we won't talk about that tonight. But at the bottom, it says here, diet and lifestyle can restore the microbiome. And it's in any age group. You shouldn't think you're too old or too far gone. Anyone can fix their microbiome with this. I'm just going to, rather than, we all know what that is, right? We can elaborate on it another time. And lifestyle, all of these different lifestyles, these changes that we make can also improve our micro, microbiome. And that's been shown in research. It's not what I believe. It's not Dr. Mann's diet. It is the diet that everyone should be following. Now, I want to just talk about restorative sleep and focus on that. And it seems that people who feel that they can't face up to this diet, people have told me, doctors have told me, counsel your patients to try to get to bed a little earlier. Try to be more well-rested. And if you're more well-rested, maybe you're going to be able to face these changes with a lot more strength and, and you will, you'll have a better chance of success. So I just want to put that in. If you feel that it seems overwhelming to you, what you need to do is sleep. But let's say you just can't handle it anymore and you've tried and, you know, you just can't handle it. What about, what about weight loss surgery? We're back to the current events again. Here's an article that came out on August 20th. I'm making you all into scientists right now. Please bear with me. I'm sure you're going to understand these slides. I want to walk you through them. The effect of diet versus gastric bypass on metabolic function in diabetes. What does that mean? They took a group of diabetics that were obese, morbidly obese. They divided them into two groups. And one group they gave a diet to. It, wasn't, it was not a whole food plant-based diet. No. The other group, they did weight loss surgery on. They actually did a bypass, not a sleeve, but a bypass, that's really strong surgery. And then what they did was they measured, they took blood work on them afterwards, after they lost a certain amount of predetermined weight. They, they measured the sugar in their bloodstream. Let's look and see what happened. Oh, thank you. So this, this looks scary if you're not in science, but really it's easy. This talks about plasma glucose. That means how much sugar is in the bloodstream. These are the people. The open circles are before the weight loss, and the closed and black circles are after the weight loss. And these are the two group, groups of patients. And I want you to know that this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the top journal on the, on the face of the earth. I'm not Dr. Greger. I can't read every journal, but I can read the New England Journal. That's like reading the New York Times. So look, look at these people. Before, here's the glucose. Oh, excuse me. My finger's not showing. Here's the glucose here. So if you look before surgery, when, before they're fed a meal, their sugar's running around 150. Not good. We all know that's too high. After they eat a meal, the sugar rises somewhat gradually up to around 250. Not good. And it takes really a long time this is a four-hour study. You see, 240 minutes. After four hours, the sugar is still not where it belongs or where it belongs, not 150 either, but it didn't even go back down to baseline. And we all know that it doesn't take four hours to digest a regular ordinary meal. But these people have diabetes, and they cannot lower their blood sugar effectively. Now, let's see what happens after they go on a diet and they lose the predetermined amount of weight, which I think was around 40 pounds. Their sugar went from 150 to 100, and when they ate, their sugar went up gradually, but look how much better it returned to baseline afterwards. It went down. That means their insulin resistance is less. They're able to utilize that sugar 
and get it into their cells. And they're going to feel more energy too, because instead of the sugar floating around in their bloodstream doing nothing, it's actually in their cells and it's helping them. Does everyone understand? Leanna, do you understand? We'll say, <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't move forward. I'm not done. Okay. So let's compare this to the surgery group who had, I consider it to be a radical treatment. After surgery, they lose the weight. Their pre-meal sugar is around 100. Still not normal. These people are still overweight, but much better. But look what happens when they eat a meal. Their sugar shoots up to 275 and eventually comes back down. And again, I'm covered up by Jody, but they never really get down to where the diet people are. They're still a little above it four hours. What is the meaning of that? What is the meaning? Let's go to the next slide. So this is a little bit different. This is a measurement of the sugar that they ate. Not real sugar. We're talking about food, a meal. So before and after the weight loss, the diet people are more or less the same. That means what it's saying. Rate of appearance means how you digest your food and how it appears in the bloodstream. And it was the same. But look at the surgery. Those who ate the same exact meal, their sugar shot up so high, and then it came down again. I have never seen this before. The truth is I didn't really study the bariatric literature. I have plenty to do with my time. But because I was talking about nutrition, I figured I'd better read this article pretty closely. Next, please. Not only that, it happens every single time you eat. If you look over here, anyone who had bariatric surgery, every time they ate a meal, boom, up, boom, up, up and down, up and down. Whereas those that stayed on a diet, it was gradual sloping of the blood sugar, much more appropriate. And I thought to myself, this seems so counterintuitive because we're always being told to eat foods with a low glycemic index. What does low glycemic index mean? It means it doesn't shoot your blood sugar up. So here you are, you go and you do a surgery that makes your blood sugar pop up and down several times during the day. So I said, you know what? I didn't really understand it. I have to go down to the bottom of it. I called a friend of mine who is an excellent bariatric surgeon, very famous in our circles, and I'm not saying his name today, but, and I, I also want to tell you that I scrubbed in on one of these sleeves because I had a patient who had a simultaneous gynecological problem, so I had to be there for her bariatric surgery, and I want to tell you, it's brutal. You see someone just cutting off, cutting out half of the stomach, and you wonder, is all of it really necessary? And I have, I just want to say another thing, if you don't mind, that I have a friend, and I, I actually even went with her because I was concerned about her second surgery. And I spoke to the bariatric surgeon there, a big surgeon, not Maimonides, a big surgeon. And he said, I know that most of them are going to fail after 10 years. I know most of them are going to gain the weight back. But for the 10 years that their weight is better, they'll have better cardiovascular profile. So they'll have that benefit. So... All in all, there's so many considerations regarding surgery. So let me tell you when I spoke to the doctor what he told me. He said, Melinda, look, don't you know when you have a bypass surgery, you eat the food, you chew it, you swallow it, and it goes straight to the small intestine. It bypasses all that digestive tract that the rest of us have, and it literally gets dumped in the small intestine where the absorption occurs. So all the sugar and all the everything is absorbed so quickly and so rapidly, that's why you have these spikes. I just think that there is a better way, and I hope that everyone understands. If anyone needs that clarified, I'd be happy to discuss it with them after this talk is over. Let's go to the next. So I have a better way. This also, current events, it just came out. I didn't even open the article yet. Reversal of gestational diabetes with a low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet. I don't know, Dr. Chuter, I would love to meet her. But I put this slide in because I want to show you that there is a trend. People are catching on. There is another way. There is a better way. But not all of us are ready. We're not all ready. Some of us are just like, okay, I hear it. It's compelling. I'm ready. I'll do it. And then 
some of us, due to our personality or just fear, fear of failure, fear of anything, we're just not ready for it yet. And there's a lot of literature on the stages of readiness for change. My thumb. So these are the stages of readiness for change. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. I think everybody can understand what all this means. Where was I when I went plant-based? I was in pre-contemplation. I went to my cardiologist, and both my parents had open-heart surgery. And my cardiologist would say to me, risk reduction, risk reduction. And I would say to him, Dr. Kirstein, all I'm doing is risk escalation. Like, I just don't know what to do anymore. And then I was fortunate enough to get introduced to plant-based through Garth Davis's book called Proteinaholic. And I skipped from pre-contemplation to maintenance overnight because I was so over ready for this. And I woke up the next day, I downloaded his book, I read and I said, that's it. Now I know why I failed all my calorie restricted diets and my Atkins diet and my, I don't, I can't even name them all. So many diets, Weight Watchers diet. How many diets can I name for you? And I also knew that there was no turning back because here was a scientific answer that I had not known until now. So I lost 60 pounds, by the way. In order to succeed, you're going to need tools. Here's one of the handiest tools we have. And this is Dr. Michael Greger. He has a daily dozen. It's a very well-known uh, list that you can put an app on your phone. And if you don't have an app, you can put it on your refrigerator. And beans, of course, are always at the top because beans are the core of a healthy diet. And as everyone wants to know, where do you get your protein from? The answer is from everything on this list, but even so, much more so beans. And I have spent the last year and a half researching beans. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, most of you have probably never seen this. This is what is known as a bedika shmata. And, you know, we have tools to help us succeed, but we also have barriers to success, and we have to figure out the solutions that are going to help us succeed. This Badika Shmata, otherwise known as a thrip cloth, which you can get from the Star K in Baltimore, is a way of che checking leafy greens for insects. Basically, you wash your leafy greens in water, and then you pour the water onto the cloth, and you look at the cloth in a strong light. We need to eat leafy green vegetables to be healthy, and this is one of the biggest problems in the observant Jewish community is we generally don't eat bugs. So we have to remove bugs before we're going to eat the leaves. I've done a lot of research about it. And I just want to show you that I've settled upon one leaf that I would like to start promoting. Where's my thumb? I would like, okay, who knows what leafy green vegetable this is? It's called collard greens, collard greens. It's not kale. Kale is glamorous, but you should know that the nutrition content of collard greens and kale, it's almost identical. And maybe I'll send an email and ask Dr. Gregor, is that really true? And it is really true. What's the difference between kale and collard greens is how sturdy the leaf is and how big the leaf is and how flat the leaf is and how easy it is to clean for bugs. Basically, you can... You can wash this leaf the way you wash a dish. And then you rinse it. And, and when you check on the bedika shmata, or we call the thrip cloth, you see that it's bug-free. And I've been working studiously on this. I made friends with all the bug rabbis in town. And I keep pestering them and hocking them that we have to come up with a solution for people who don't eat bugs on their greens. And I believe that we have to explore this more. And I believe that Karen has to come up with a bunch of recipes for collard greens, and it's going to be wonderful. And you probably already have some, right, Karen? <laughs> um, yeah, I have a few ideas. Great. Okay, next slide. Now, another, another um, barrier for me personally for success was I have to eat all these greens. So you have to put something on your greens. So if you listen around, everyone's giving you all these recipes for fat-free salad dressing, which personally, I don't have time to make any of them. And I've been trying all sorts of solutions. And finally, I tried this, 
I don't have stock in the company. I happen to love it. It's zero fat. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not here right now to talk about should you have some fat and which fat you should have. But what, what I would like to tell you is because this is zero fat, you can choose what fat you want to put on your salad. You don't have to take the fat that the, that the manufacturer puts in that may not be of the quality that you're looking for. And this is very delicious. If you look at the ingredient list, you'll see how delicious it is. So I bought, since I discovered this, I made friends with my health food store man and he just got me a case of it and I stuck it in the freezer. So I know that I always have a salad dressing. And this is something that I would never have conceived of eating in December, 2018. I have my collard greens. I have some sourdough rye bread, which is the easiest sourdough to make. You don't need it. You just put it in like a batter. And I have hummus and I have sprouts on top. And you're probably thinking to yourself, why would I ever want to eat that? That does not appeal to me. But I'm going to tell you, when you fix your microbiome and the brain-gut connection, you're going to start thinking that that is really good. And it is really good. Am I running over time? No, you're doing great. I'm doing great. Thank you. Okay, this is my Tuesday meal. I just ate it last Tuesday. Now, why do I call it a Tuesday meal? Because Tuesday nights is a reward meal because I go on the scale on Tuesday morning. And I go on even if I think I gain weight. And the reward is not that I lost weight. The reward is I was brave enough to go on the scale. <laughs> so then every Tuesday night, I try to give myself a nice meal. So here was my meal. I came home. I put this ripe pear in the oven. This is because people want to know what do you eat. You can't imagine how many people are asking me what do I eat. So this is in response to that. I stuck the pear in the oven. I don't really like eating raw food at night. I'm just too tired for that. I want something hot and I want to go to sleep. So I put the pear in the oven. I took my masa harina, which makes tortillas, which I make homemade because I don't like store-bought and they're so easy to make. And I'm sure Karen will tell you that that's true. I poured boiling, I made boiled water. I poured it on the masa harina. Then I covered it. I stirred it up. I covered it. I drove my son to class. I came back. By the time I came back, I just kind of kneaded the masa a little. I opened up the can of black beans and I squirted some of this barbecue sauce in there that I found in bingo. And I made a few tortillas and I was happy. Now, I forgot to eat my green leafy vegetable, but that's okay. I ate it the next night. And then I had some of this chocolate. So I think that was a very nice meal. I don't know if you agree with me, but, and my microbiome was so happy. What I love about it, Dr. Mann, is it's, it's a throw together kind of meal. And it, it really, like, you can do this. People can do this. It sure you can do it. In the kitchen, right? And not only that, this masa harina, which I could tell a funny story about, Okay, I'm going to tell a story. I go to Whole Foods not too often. It's so inconvenient to go there. And because I'm a, you know, this worker, as I show them my badge, my ID, they let me write in, right? So I'm always looking for organic because I don't want GMO and all this. And I'm not, I'm not strict about organic at all. But when it comes to corn, I'm a little more careful. So I go into Whole Foods. I see they got a whole big delivery of masa. So I take like six bags of it. I go to the checkout and the lady says to me, I'm sorry, it's COVID. You can only have one bag of flour. So I said to her, it's not flour, it's corn. She said, ma'am, it says on it flour. You can only have one bag. So I bought the one bag, and then I went back into the store five more times, and I bought five more bags. Okay, <laughs> fine. Here we go. Okay. Ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it really shows to what, to what extent you have to go to be whole food plant-based. And, and sometimes you just have to do it. Okay, let's get to Rosh Hashanah. We barely spoke about it now. You're thinking, well, what does this have to do with Rosh Hashanah? This has to do with Rosh Hashanah, and it has to do with weddings. This is what I used to do when I used to go to a weekday wedding. I would basically fast the whole day because I knew I was going to eat who knows what when I went to the wedding. And then I would go to the wedding and eat everything, whatever I felt like. So I stopped doing that. So what I do now is I don't fast on the day that I go to a weekday wedding. And what I do is on the way to the wedding, I get some roasted edamame. And when I'm in the car, I know it says here a snack, but I don't look at this as a snack. I look at this as food. And indeed, it is food. So I eat a portion, one portion, a third of a cup, 10 grams of protein, and it has a nice amount of fat in it as well because it's soy. I eat that until I feel I'm not hungry anymore. 
Then I go to the wedding by the Shmorius board and I eat fruits and vegetables. In, in the old days, I used to run to get sesame chicken, farfel, all this kind of stuff. But when you walk into the wedding and you're full, you really are full, you're not really running to those chafing dishes. So I'm, I'm good to go. Then after the chuppah, you sit down and yes, I wash on a roll and it's refined white flour. And, you know, you have to like just draw the line somewhere. And I eat everything. Sometimes I ask for two bowls of soup and I leave my chicken cutlet on the plate. And if I get a chance, I say, please don't bring me the chicken cutlet because who wants to throw food in the garbage? But I took this picture and I want, I want you to understand that you can sort of do the same thing if it's Rosh Hashanah or any other holiday and you're invited out, you can eat your soybeans before you go, and you're going to say, well, I don't like soybeans. And you know what? I also don't like soybeans. But I'm telling you that if you're really hungry, if you're really hungry, and you eat these, you're really going to like them. And if you keep eating them, you're going to like them even more, because this is the most, this, this is the food that takes away hunger so fast. And I recommend it highly, no stock in the company. <laughs> Dr. Mann, maybe this is the right time to pause and address the question about tofu and soy consumption. Would you speak to that briefly? I know a, a lot of people have been told by their doctors not to eat soy because of its estrogen content, but I know there's more to that story. So do you want to speak to that? So um, I'm, qu I'm basically quoting Dr. Greger and a lot of other doctors who have done the research and I'm relying on their knowledge um, and I'm giving over basically that the literature shows that if we eat a normal amount of soy, not only doesn't it cause breast cancer, but it protects against breast cancer. Also, women who have breast cancer, it tends to protect against recurrence and improves longevity. So the amount of soy that you're talking about, no, none of us could eat. It has to be someone who's kind of an OCD soy eater eating 16 servings of soy a day. The estrogen-like substance in soy, actually, they displace actual estrogen. So that is considered to be the mechanism of how these soy products work in the body. Uh, there's a Dr. Christy Funk who I only recently started looking into what she's talking about, but she wrote a scholarly work on breast disease. And you can refer to that if you would like more information on soy. Okay, I happen great. to not like tofu. I tried every tofu imaginable. I don't like it. I Each his own. Maybe mar super marinated the way Karen makes it would, would make it tasty, but we can move Right, on. so I don't have time to make a marinade. I'd rather buy the beans and eat the beans, and, and I'm good. I'm good to go. Great. So, again, talking about Rosh Hashanah. So, you know, after candle lighting, we're really not going to eat until we have a meal. So for the people who want to use the method and they're invited out and they don't want to eat the so-called animal protein source. So I would tell you to eat your soybeans. And what happened? It said click to exit. Oh, sorry. Let can me... you fix me? Yeah, I'm going to fix you. That was my fault. Um, you, can, you can eat those soybeans an hour before candle lighting and they will tide you over until you get to the meal. And, and remember, we also learned that you don't have to combine your beans and your grains at the same meal. So you're going to do just fine that way. Um, I had a picture of my special beans. What happened to them? I, I, I'm not sharing my slides anymore. Now it's taking a little time to get back to us. So okay, so I'll tell you. Beans. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what that is. The the bag of beans that I was showing you. I've done. I read a book on beans. I I go everywhere with beans. I go. I'm like Sherlock Holmes when it comes to beans. And I, I need to find all different types of beans because when people tell me that they're bored, I just give them a different bean and a different sauce and a different spice, and then they're not bored anymore. Aren't you bored of chicken cutlets? That's why I answer them back. So these beans, they're actually grown in Greece, and the name of the company is Erosis, and they're called gigandis. They're called Greek giant beans. They come white and they come brown. How did I even find out about these beans? Some, one of my students saw that I was eating whole food plant-based. She said to me, Dr. Mann, you have to go to Fairway Supermarket. They have a lot of interesting things there. I never heard of Fairway Supermarket. So I went there and I went with my Sherlock Holmes. And in the freezer section, I found this cooked dish, not this. I found a cooked dish 
of Greek beans in tomato sauce with different vegetables, including leeks, by the way, that makes it good for Rosh Hashanah. And it was frozen and had a chafke on it. And it was imported from Greece. I took it home, I heated it up, and I said, this is one of the best things I've ever eaten. So I started more research, what is this all about? And I went back to Fairway and they stopped stocking it. So I was disappointed. And I have this lady in my neighborhood who cooks for me. She has a little catering store on 16th Avenue here in Bar Park. And I said, I have the label. Can you recreate this recipe for me? So I went to the Greek store because you can only buy these in a Greek store. You can't buy these anywhere. There's one Greek store in Brooklyn. There's one Greek store in Queens. I've been to both of them. And I make friends with the owners and the managers. And soon I'm going to be friends with the distributors. And I, <laughs> I got these beans. I brought them to her. And she recreated the recipe. And I have tons of it frozen. And I eat it on special occasions. I can eat it for Shabbos, et cetera, et cetera. We have to – this is a very personal – journey. Everyone has to find out what they like. I also love stuffed peppers for Shabbos or Yantif because it's this big thing. It's filled with all kinds of things. And people look at your play like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I would like that also. So instead of chicken on my plate, this is what I do. Great. Um, uh, just one word on the environment. You know, our world is getting crowded and all of this plant-based eating that I've been talking about is really good for the environment. So I just wanted to say one word about that. We shouldn't forget. And uh, Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah for me is a connection to our eternal nation. The Jewish nation is an eternal nation. And it's kind of hard for me to think of eating sushi with some dulse flakes sprinkled on it to get a more fishy feel for Rosh Hashanah. It's just not me. Will I be eating fish on Rosh Hashanah? Chances are yes. Maybe uh, the amount of my thumbnail. But can we go back, please? Because I want to say that this is my mother's great-grandparents, which makes them my great-great-grandparents. And these are the types of things that we have to also take into consideration when we're making food choices. And I want to almost finish by quoting Dr. David Katz, who is like a brilliant, charismatic speaker who has a command of the English language. And I highly recommend, I've never met the man, but if you just listen to him, you'll be so inspired. And so many other physicians in the field. Dr. Katz went on front lines in the Bronx when COVID came out, just so he could know what was going on. I myself was on the front lines and... If I, do I have time to tell a short story or I'm in trouble? Uh, go ahead. We'll, we'll go right to questions after. Fine. I was, I was doing office hours during the height of COVID and in walked a 32-week patient with a bottle of antacid, antacid in her hand. She was having chest pain. And she said, they told me it was indigestion. And she was wearing the mask like down, like everything. And I looked at her and I said, you're sick. And I listened to her lungs and she had COVID lungs. And I have never heard lungs like that in my career. A new physical diagnosis phenomenon of COVID lungs. And I just had such a pachad, a fear, a dread. I didn't know what to do with her. I couldn't even send her to the hospital because there was nowhere to put her. I called her internist. Thankfully, he was in. He took her. We gave her hydroxychloroquine, and we gave her a Z-Pack, and we gave her vitamin C and Z. We gave her as much as we could throw at her. And thankfully, she pulled through as an outpatient. But I want to tell you that our, our goal here, as Dr. David Katz would say, is to add years to our life and life to our years. And that's so profound. And And... And we, we don't want to get caught up in COVID. We want to live to be a great-grandparent and hold our great-grandchild on our lap. And, and that's why I'm here, because I have been blessed to have elderly parents who became great-grandparents, and I wish that for everybody here. And, and, and if, if watching what you're eating and, and monitoring your lifestyle is going to help you achieve that. And we won't have to do rescue medicine and have more articles in the New England Journal of Medicine about how much we're spending on medical care. 
it's so much a better lechatchila way of having a healthy life. And, and that's the message of this talk. Okay, Barbie, Dr. Barbie, excuse me. You like the stethoscope around her neck? She looks very cute, no? Okay, who knows the answer to the question? Oh, yes, she got to the seamstress. She fixed her skirt. Thank you. <laughs> so the answer is obviously fiber. Fiber is the answer. We need to ramp up our intake of plant-based fiber foods. Thank you very much. Interesting information. Um, is to just pause for a moment and um, share with you a little bit, um, let somebody in, a little bit about um, what we're hoping to show you afterwards. Um, we have some wonderful recipes that Karen Stern put together for all of you uh, as a, a way of sort of bringing in Rosh Hashanah and trying out some new recipes. Karen, what I'm going to do is share my screen so that they can see the recipe packet that you've collected, um, that you've put together for everybody. And I want to thank Vivian Lee for all the great formatting work she did on the, on the packet. Um, but here is, here's the packet. Don't mind that crossword puzzle. Um, <laughs> so Karen, will you tell us a little bit about what's inside the recipes that people will be receiving after tonight's program? Yeah, sure. Um, I've been cooking plant-based for about 12 years. So I picked the recipes that I make often that are easy and hard to mess up and that I think taste good. And, you know, the kids love them, the adults love them. So um, the fall rainbow salad is very colorful. There's a variety of vegetables. Um, I like a little crunch in my salad, so I put pistachios, but if you're not doing nuts, which a lot of people try to minimize their nuts on a whole food plant-based diet, um, I substitute them with those freeze-dried beet chips. They don't have any added oil or uh, salt. And then I gave you a sample salad dressing that you can make, which is also oil-free. It's a date sweetened honey mustard, and it goes well with it. Um, if you go to the Forks Over Knives website, which is where I got this particular recipe, they have a lot more dressings that um, are equally as healthy that you could try if they're more appealing. Okay, um, the sweet and sour chickpeas. So I use chickpeas in a can a lot, which isn't the best way to, <laughs> to cook with beans. Um, but the original recipe you just throw all these ingredients in a slow cooker using the dried beans. And that's literally all you do. You just throw it in there, you turn it on and it's done and it's delicious. Um, oh, so the sauce that kind of, um, all the ingredients except for the chickpeas, if you use it as a salad dressing, um, it works that way as well. It's just the cold version of it. Um, the roasted balsamic miso Brussels sprouts, you can actually use other vegetables if you are not a fan of Brussels sprouts. You cook it the same way, um, so that's an option. Let's see, the, I don't think I have these in the right order, but the raw apple crumble, Leanna actually has made this. I have not, but it looks delicious, and it's a simple, easy, healthy dessert using apples, which are great to use for this holiday. Um, and all these, I gave the websites that you can go back to reference them. Um, there's more pictures on there. There's could be a blog for some of them. So that might be a good idea. Uh, the sweet potato whole wheat hollow rolls are delicious. Um, sorry, I'm not going in the order. I don't think that you're showing it. I'm sorry. Um, I'll wait for you to get there. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So in this particular recipe, um, they're more savory if you use the herbs, but I've also replaced the herbs with cinnamon to make it kind of like a cinnamon roll type of bread. So you can go either direction with this. And I use whole wheat flour and it turns out just as well as using the white flour, which is called for in the original recipe. Um, let's see what I have next. I also created a kid's menu. We actually made these for our Labor Day cookout today though for the adults. Um, it's super easy. I used to make a super complicated 
vegan hot dog. These are easy. Um, you just make the marinade by stirring all the ingredients together. You soak the tofu dog in it and you grill it. Actually, I lied. Okay, the number two step, and this is a tip that I would suggest for any tofu dish that you make. I've been eating this way for so long and about six months ago, I discovered the trick of how to make tofu um, firm and chewy without frying it. I've tried lots of different ways and there's other ways than what I'm about to tell you, but this works best for me. So you open the tofu package, you press it down with paper towels to get all the water out. You cut it into whatever size slices that you'd like. You turn on the, um, the, the skillet. I use a nonstick oil spray, but you don't have to if you have a good nonstick pan. And just for a few minutes on each side, you cook the tofu to a golden brown and it takes out all the water, it makes it chewy. So I do that for all my Asian stir fries. I make chicken nuggets with it. Um, it just makes it firm and chewy, which is how I like it. So um, after you do that, then you soak it in the marinade and then you can grill it, you can saute it. And it tastes like a hot dog, I think. Again, I haven't had one in 12 years, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen. There, there was a quick question also for the, the whole wheat rolls. Um, for those who are gluten-free, I can't imagine you've ever tried to make this recipe with oat flour, but do you think it would, it would hold with that or? or? Um, it probably would, but you probably would have to change the recipe up a little bit using you know, a flax egg, things like that. I mean, I could probably create one and we could send it out, but I don't know that you could use this exact recipe. That's okay. Thanks. Okay. And then I think you had one more recipe here, right? Yes. The mac and cheese. I said it was for kids, but it's my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I've also made lots of different mac and cheese sauces in the past decade, and this is my favorite, and it's super simple. Um, you put all the ingredients in a Vitamix, blend it for about a minute, and it's super creamy, and I think it tastes like cheese. If you don't have a Vitamix, soak your cashews overnight in water, drain them the next day, and it should work pretty well in just a regular high-speed blender. Um, we put the mac and cheese sauce over usually some type of lentil, or now I've discovered edamame pasta. I'm not sure that that's a new thing, but it's new for us, and it's my new favorite. Any pasta will work, whole wheat, um, whatever your kids will eat. This is a healthy sauce to use with it. Great. Right. So yeah, that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Karen. And I want to move to some questions so that we have a chance to sort of dig into some of the details. Um, what I love that you've brought up tonight is not just um, sort of the general considerations that we should have about plant-based eating, but connecting them to this more sort of metaphysical way of thinking at this time of year when there's a lot of introspection during the month of Elul as we lead into Rosh Hashanah and um, consider what life is for, consider what um, food is for and how to put everything in perspective. And I think you've really offered something, great food for thought, as we like to say. Um, I think you know, one of the questions I'd like to start off with for you is just to ask you to share a little bit further about your own story. When you made these changes for yourself, what did you see? What, what happened? And, and, and did you go, obviously you said you were in this pre-contemplation phase for a little while, but then you, you got it into high gear and you really went in and you dove in. Tell us more about the process and then what the impact was from going all in. So I don't, I don't know if it's really, for me, pre-contemplation was really more the stage of ignorance as a physician, I just did not really have the exposure. And I didn't mention it, but the way I got to Dr. Davis was through my own specialty, American College of OBGYN, and they were featuring Dr. Davis as a keynote speaker. And I just thought that was really interesting. ACOG, American College of OBGYN, is coming on board with this. And so when I saw his name in my journal, I'm reading, you know, what's going to be on the agenda for this year's meeting. And I was just I was intrigued, so I Googled him, I listened to a couple of his talks, downloaded the book, and by the next morning, I said, that's it, I don't care what I eat, but I am getting off animal products, I'm getting off. 
Um, I knew about the environment, but not much, not much. I wasn't a big YouTuber because the internet, unfortunately, is filled with a lot of stuff that I don't want my eyes to see. And, <clears throat> and I had to struggle with that a little bit, but um, I, I, I kind of persevered and I did get online and I educated myself um, from some of the online stuff. I also started going to different supermarkets and I also bought crutch foods. For example, Kite Hill almond yogurt. I needed something to transition. In fact, Dr. Goldhammer, Alan Goldhammer says, it takes about three months to really transition, especially with the fat issue. So having the almond products from Kite Hill was extremely helpful. And they also make this ricotta cheese, which I love and I still love it. And I make it occasionally. But I sort of gave all that up because it's kind of high fat stuff. And I realized that the weight was going to come off better if I just started eating less fat. I don't eat zero fat. I do eat fat. I also had trouble getting used to water sauteing. I found that even if I put a teaspoon of the best olive oil in the world, it makes a very big difference. It's 40 calories. It just makes a really big difference for me. If, but I try not even to have sauteed vegetables. Most of the time I put it in my soup. So these are different what's the right word, strategies that I sort of use to just keep going. Don't stop, keep going. And it paid off. My hemoglobin A1C is 5.1. My husband and I joke, he's like, why is your hemoglobin A1C 5.1? You eat so much carbs. And I say to him, because I don't have any insulin resistance. If you don't eat foods that cause insulin resistance, which I didn't really touch on in this talk because... I was given instructions to go down to the bare bones. But if your insulin resistance is low, you can have those complex carbohydrates and you're really a happy person. Absolutely. And that's great. Thank you. And, and I think what you've shown us also is that there are many shades of acceptance of sort of the principles of whole food plant-based nutrition you, um, and that we don't have to be purists about it in order to really see dramatic changes in our own bodies as we eat more plant foods and reduce the fat consumption, reduce the animal products, reduce the processed foods. Um, there were some, I, I love what you brought up before about the issues with the greens and how, you know, in, in some parts of the Jewish community, bug checking is a huge issue. And I certainly know from my own experience in my own home um, that sometimes those greens just come in and you have to throw them all out and it's really sad. Uh, but um, there was a question that came in about what about hydroponically grown greens? Is that something where, you know, bugs might be less commonly found? So there's a very good company in Lakewood called Verdini, and they have certified hydroponically grown bug-free vegetables. I, I'm in touch with some of my bug rabbis, and they tell me that it's extremely reliable. As far as nutrition goes, I don't know if they're completely nutritionally equivalent, but certainly it's better than not having leafy greens. It's better to have the hydroponic than to not have them at all. I didn't really talk about sprouts, which I do eat. Um, I'm also trying to amass a collection of sprouts that don't need to be checked for bugs. So that's also something good, but a sprout is not a leaf and we still, we can have sprouts and we, we still need to have those leaves. Right. Yes. And I know we've studied before with Dr. Ron Weiss, who has uh, an organic farm out in New Jersey, and he has spoken about the importance of healthy soil for, for maximizing the nutrients in our plants. But definitely, you're right. Water, wa even if it's grown in water, it's better to have those greens than to not have them at all. Um, so that's a great point. Um, I think that's all the questions that we had on the chat box. I want to thank some of the folks in the chat for giving some great ideas also for different uh, dressings and other other ways to sort of approach food. So um, it's really nice to have the community pitch in and answer questions here. Um, before we close, Dr. Mann, I want to actually turn it over to Jody and have her share with us just a little bit about Jewish Veggies work um, because we have, while Plant Powered Metro New York is really focused on nutrition, 
um, very specifically so that we can um, have as many people as possible understand the science and the art of plant-based living. Um, Jewish Veg has a wider mission I think it's important for everybody to know about. So Jody, will you share with us your work? Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me tonight. And what a what an incredible presentation. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mann, and to Karen for those delicious uh, recipes. Uh, so I am Jody Graber. I am the East Coast Engagement Manager for Jewish Veg. And for those of you who are not familiar with Jewish Veg, uh, we've been the Jewish voice of the plant-based movement for nearly a half a century. This year, the organization is celebrating 45 our 45th anniversary. And our mission is to inspire and assist Jews to embrace a plant-based lifestyle as an expression of the Jewish values of compassion for animals and care for our health and for our environment. And uh, we do this through many different programs and campaigns. Uh, for instance, we, we do a vegan birthright trip to Israel, which unfortunately, as you can imagine, had to be canceled this year. So hopefully next year we'll be back doing that. Uh, we also have a speakers bureau. So uh, myself, my colleagues, we speak to congregations around the country. And certainly we've been doing this virtually for the past few months to help uh, inspire Jews, our fellow Jews, to adopt a plant-based diet. And we do build community through our chapters. We have a chapter in New York City, uh, Washington, D.C., L.A. We have a brand new chapter starting in San Francisco. And uh, we also lead major campaign, uh, public campaign efforts. So uh, we have a campaign with Kaporos. Um, and in fact, we do have an event um, on Wednesday evening of this week to talk about a kinder Kaporos. Um, and for those of you who may not be aware of what Kaporos is, it is a, a, a very important tradition uh, in the Jewish faith, um, but they, they use chickens. And uh, so we're, we're trying to you know, work with the community to find a kinder way to do it. Um, and also to make sure that anti-Semitism is taken out of the, uh, the, the actions because we certainly want Jews to be able to practice their faith and, and traditions. Uh, Jewish Veg has just started, uh, just launched a new campaign called Toward a Pandemic-Free World because we know that the choice of a plant-based food system is going to help prevent the next zoonotic outbreak. And we know that a plant-based diet is going to help us survive this current one. Uh, the website for that is pandemicfree.org. I invite you all to take a look. Uh, we also have a new program called Plant Pathways, which is to help Jews adopt a plant-based diet and, and still feel the community because, of course, uh, so much of our holidays and uh, our, our, you know, our Shabbos gatherings, they're about community. We want to be together with our fellow Jews, and we want to feel very comfortable eating a plant-based diet. So we have that, uh, that new program. And um, as I mentioned, we have the Kinder Kaporos uh, event coming up, and I'll, uh, I'll put some of this in the chat as well. Um, and we also, this coming Sunday, now the 13th, um, we are going to have some cooking demos for Rosh Hashanah. And so I certainly invite all of you to join us for that. Uh, we're we're going to create a, uh, a, vegan, a vegan meal that we can, that we can all share uh, for the high holiday. So that's on Sunday, September 13th. Um, and I invite you to join us. And uh, yeah, happy to take any questions if you have. And I, you know, I'm so happy to be here and uh, to be collaborating with, with Liana because I've just been a fan of, of Plant Powered and know all the great work. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Jody. It's great to have you and to have so many of uh, your members here joining us as well. Um, and I think I just wanted to close by saying again, thank you, Dr. Mann. Thank you, Karen, for the great recipes. Um, and uh, to just note the season and how sometimes what we do at this moment really sets the tone for the year ahead. Um, if anybody's feeling inspired and would like to share an intention that they have for the coming year about their own personal um, 
habits, uh, food habits, whatever it might be, something that you might uh, do differently because of tonight's talk or in light of um, perhaps a number of events that you have attended with Plant Powered Metro New York or otherwise, um, I invite you to share that with others in the chat box um, or just to consider this a moment of re reflection because the kavanah, the intentions that we bring into the new year are just so important. Um, and they don't have to stop here. And part of our, our mission at Plant Power Metro New York is to make sure that people have community and know where to turn to when you need help making change. Um, so we hope that you come back and uh, engage with us as well. We, we actually also have a cooking demo on Sunday. I think it's at 5 p.m. I hope that doesn't overlap with yours, Jody. Um, but uh, we have our chef, Carol Levy, uh, who will be doing a demo that, that evening of some wonderful stews and uh, fritters that you can replicate as well. And uh, going farther into September, you can look at our website. I've posted it on in the chat box here. And I'm also going to put our social media handle here in case you're on Instagram or want to connect with us on Facebook. Um, lots of ways to connect and be engaged. And we just hope that you are able to, um, th that you feel inspired to reach out and connect with us as you go on this path with us. Um, the recipes will be emailed out to all of you. Um, if not later tonight, then definitely tomorrow. And a uh, recording will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and otherwise, I want to wish all of you a very wonderful evening and best wishes for Ashana Tova Umutuka. Uh, thank you again. Take care, everybody. Good night. Thank you.